Let's open our Bibles tonight. And before we get started with the Scripture in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, we need to have nursery. Turn me out, Brother Roy. If you Work on this one now for a little while while I'm starting. Nursery workers, not quite that much. Meeting tonight. I know that God has called and laid it on some of you fine ladies' heart to help in the nursery. I don't really know that, but I hope and pray that He has. I hope and pray that the Lord has laid it on somebody's heart to help in the nursery. Buddy, I tell you, they're about ready to give up ship and sink back there. I mean, they're about ready to... I don't commit suicide or what they are overloaded. And we need some of you nice, fine, Christian, dedicated ladies to volunteer to help at least one service. I don't know how you usually do that. One service a month or is it one service a week? The usual nursery schedule. Whatever. It depends on how many volunteers there are, but it's been a lot for, a, for some lately. And anyway, we need you to bone this. We're going to meet right over there in the ladies' choir room as soon as service is over tonight. We won't hold you long. And um, I've got to talk to some other folks, too, and a lot of other things didn't go somewhere after that. And so uh, we're, we won't hold you long. If you'll please meet with us tonight. That'd be a blessing. Some of you older teenage girls, uh, 18, 19, might want to volunteer to help out. You needed to be learning how. Take care of them young'uns. That's right. That's what God will have for you one of these days, maybe. And so if, y'all, if some of you all, uh, I'd rather not have anyone younger maybe than 18 as a regular nursery worker, but uh, some of you young marrieds or uh, mamas or grandmothers that's done got your kids raised and want to be around those sweet little darlings back there. Maybe you could help. That's right. Amen. All righty. Okay, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, I told you we'd be bringing the message this evening on the subject, the religion of the Antichrist. The religion of the Antichrist. One of them's rolling with them. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is one of the most uh, plain, explicit passages of Scripture anywhere in the New Testament on the Antichrist. Now, if you ever run into one of them, some of the old-time preachers will try to tell you that there ain't no such thing as the Antichrist. Have you ever heard one of the old preachers teach that? Raise your hand. Now, a lot of people say, well, bless God, them old preachers taught it that way. I don't believe it's right. Now, I respect the old preachers, but where the old preachers are not in line with the book, they're wrong. Where the new preachers are not in line with the book, they're wrong. Amen? And on this issue, they are not in line with the book. They are not in line with the book. A man that teaches you there's no such thing as the Antichrist as one man coming is wrong. He may be sincere, he may be dedicated, he may know the Scriptures backwards and forwards, but he's wrong on that point. And that's what a lot of people can't figure out. They figure, how in the world could a great man be wrong? That's easy for great men to be wrong. Every great man's wrong on something. Nobody's got it all figured out yet. And what me and you are, we're poor little dumb students of the Word of God and come to it with a believing heart and, and, a, and a believing mind and an open heart saying, God, we'll believe it if you'll show us something from your Word. Now look at chapter 2 of Second Thessalonians and verse number 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto Him. There's the rapture. That ye be not soon shaken in mind 2,000 years ago, or be troubled neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. 
Now, I don't have time to go into it, but there's where a lot of people believe in a split rapture or, or a uh, mid-tribulation rapture, which means the church will stay here through the first three and a half years until the Antichrist is revealed. Ain't that what the verse said? That day will not come till the man of sin be revealed. Now, there's a problem there. And the problem is, something, something's wrong, brother. And the problem is that the day of the Lord don't always mean the same day. 24-hour period. The day of the Lord in the Bible is a time period that starts at the rapture and runs all the way into the millennium. And that can be proved. I can show you where the day of the Lord's called the, in the tribulations called the day of the Lord. I can show you where the, even the parts of the millennium is called the day of the Lord. I can show you in the Bible where it said the day of the Lord comes a thief in the night. And I can also show you in the Bible where the day of the Lord is a morning with thick, gloomy clouds. So the day of the Lord, the term, the expression, day of the Lord, represents not always just one day, but a long time period. Like in that day, or in that day. You know, people say, back in them days. Boy, they say, what a terrible day that'll be when the water's turning to blood. They don't always refer to it as one 24-hour period. Now, let me show you how we know that's right. Look at verse number 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. There is the Antichrist. How do you know it's him? Well, first of all, he's called the man of sin. Second, he's called the son of perdition. And look what he does. Verse 4. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. He sits in the temple at Jerusalem, which incidentally, they're now making plans to build, they say. <coughs> excuse, me, excuse me. And he exalts himself above all that is called God. Verse 5. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now ye know what withholdeth that it might be revealed in his time. He said, you know what's stopping him from coming right now. Verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity, that's the spirit of the Antichrist, doth already work. I told you about it this morning. Only he who now letteth. Now somebody tell me what that word letteth means in your King James English. Can you hear it? Well, the word it's adopt it means hinder. Or allow, like what he allow? Is that what you're talking about? He that led him. That word let in your King James Bible means hinder. Paul used it back over there. He said, I would have come to you, but was let hitherto. And that's the real meaning of the word. You say, Well, the Bible's got it wrong. No, the Bible's got it right. Modern English has got it wrong. The old English word let meant to hinder, to stop, to keep from happening. That microphone, I, I won't let it fall, see? <laughs> I won't let it fall. It can't fall because I won't let it. And the Antichrist won't come until this, whoever this he is here will let him come. Now look at it. Verse number 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth, you stop, you hinder, will let until he be taken out of the way. Now who's that? Who, who stops the Antichrist from coming? It's a he. It ain't the church. The church is a she. Holy Ghost, best I can tell. There's a lot of preachers preach it different. I know a lot of good Bible teachers that say, and you can't prove it because it don't say, but the only one I know of that's possibly strong enough to keep the Antichrist spirit from taking over would be the Holy Spirit of God. It doesn't say that. I just kind of, I, I gather it, you can say, from the Scripture. If you want to argue about it, well, you can argue about it. 
But he said, he that now let it. There's one person that stops the Antichrist from coming, and that person will stop it until that person's took out of the way. There's the rapture. And when that person's took out of the way, that person lives inside us, and that person said, I'll never leave you, nor forsake you. So when he goes, we go. And the Antichrist can't come until he's gone. Look at it. Verse 8. And then, as soon as that one's taken out of the way, the Holy Spirit of God, then shall that wicked, capital W, that's a person, be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him. There you go. There's a way you know it's talking about a man. Whose coming is after the working of Satan. Look, look, look at this now. With all power and signs and lying wonders, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Here's another great important issue. I'm going to give you my opinion on this. I can't prove this from Scripture, but I, I hardly prove it. I about can. <coughs> Anybody who has had a clear presentation of the Gospel, had a chance to receive it, the Holy Spirit of God dealt with them, they had a fresh, real opportunity to receive Jesus Christ, and turned him down and said no, will not be saved after the rapture. Now listen. You say, well, where do you get that, preacher? From this verse right here. He deceived them. Why? Because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. They had a chance and turned it down. And God said in verse 11, this caused God to send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Now, we know there's going to be a lot of people saved during the tribulation. In the book of Revelation chapter 6 and 7, it tells us there's a great multitude. Nobody knew how big it was. From all nations, not just Jews. Some people preach that there's only Jews going to be saved in the tribulation. Not so. There's 144,000 Jews go out and evangelize, and they get converts from everywhere. And they come out with palms in their hands in Revelation 7. And the angel said, who in the world is that? And he said, these are they that have come out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. That's a great number of people from every tribe. All right, verse number 12. That they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. I know of a lot of the old timers, they say that's talking about the homosexuals. As a woman taught me one time, she said, you believe a homosexual can be saved? And I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, well, I don't. She said, they can't be saved. The Bible said, God, I'm be damned. That's the way she said it. And I said, no, wait a minute. And that, that's the scripture that she was quoting. And that's one of the old time saints. And bless her heart, she was sincere. But that verse ain't talking about homosexuals. That verse is talking about people that had a chance to receive the love of the truth and turned her down, brother. God said, whether well, those homosexuals or not, they might have been good moral uh, so-called church members and still believe that lie and be damned. Well, that thought in mind tonight, I want to bring you a few thoughts on the religion of the Antichrist. You'll need to keep your Bibles open briefly. The Antichrist is not here now, but his spirit doth. Present tense, already work. He will come. When He does come, He will deceive the whole world. Now, I'm going to show you tonight that the devil or the Antichrist is a perfect counterfeit or copycat of the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants to be just as much like Jesus as He can possibly be. And a matter of fact, when He comes, a big part of the world will think He is the Messiah. They're looking for Him. The Jews are looking for their Messiah tonight. They don't believe Jesus Christ was the Messiah. They're still over at that wailing wall every day doing like this, saying prayers, looking for their Messiah. When the Antichrist comes, they'll think He is the Messiah long waited for by the Jewish kingdom. They'll make Him their king. He'll do all right for three and a half years. And then He'll go and sit down in that temple. And He'll say, you've got to have this mark. And when He says that, they're going to know He's a fake. Because they know their old 
Testament and God told them in the Old Testament not to take no marks on their hand or not to take any marks on their flesh, and then they're going to run from Him and realize He was a crook. But He is, in the Bible, a perfect counterfeit. Now let me give you these things. Jesus is light. The devil is made an angel of light. Jesus in the Bible is called the angel of the Lord. The devil in the Bible is Antichrist. It's called the angel of the pit. Revelation chapter 9. Jesus is called the king of kings. And the devil is called the king over the children of pride. Jesus is called God in the flesh. The devil is called the God of this world. Jesus has a bride who is a city, New Jerusalem. The devil has a bride who is a city, Babylon. The, the, the Lord quotes Scripture. The devil quotes Scripture. Jesus' ministry lasts three and a half years. The Antichrist ministry lasts three and one half years. And if it were not for the Holy Ghost of God living in our heart, you couldn't tell them apart. Y'all pray for me. I'm getting choked up. And I'll get through this. Alright? I want to show you some things he's counterfeiting. The Antichrist religion is a love and well. The other night when I got through preaching, I preached a little bit on Satanism. And there's a lady come up after church. She said, I want to give you this. And this is what she gave me. This is a reproduction of a paper out of a magazine for teenage girls called Young Miss. It's in the, teen, it's in the public school library. I don't know, how many of you girls ever seen that magazine? Young Miss. Yes, Young and then MS, okay? Here's what it's got in it. Saturday night seance. Evil spirits won't stand the ghost of a chance as you party to raise the dead with a Saturday night seance. Dress in somber black. Bring lots of candles. Say spooky things. See into the future. Contact dead rock stars. Try to figure out who's cheating and moving the Ouija board. You will need this in a public school in the library. You will need Ouija board, crystal ball, one deck tarot cards with instructions, the eye of a frog, a voodoo doll, yothers, assorted pins and needles for teenage girls. Questions to ask the spirit world. What really happened to Jim Morrison? Jim Morrison of the doors, you know. I'll tell you what happened to him. He OD'd and killed himself. What are the answers to tomorrow's trigonometry quiz? In the future, will River Phoenix ever get a decent haircut? If all our hands are on the, on the, on the table on the Ouija board, who's that touching my knee? Seance soundtrack. Abracadabra. Sympathy for the Devil by the Rolling Stones. Ghostbusters. Devil with a blue dress on. Black Magic Woman. You remember that song by Santana? I used to have that tape. And Stairway to Heaven played backwards. We are living in a revival of the religion of the Antichrist. Now let me say this evening, that first of all, the Antichrist has a counterfeit Godhead. Take your Bible and turn to Revelation chapter 16. I will show it to you. Revelation chapter number 16, and look at, uh, I believe, verse 13. Revelation chapter 16 and verse number 13. We see here a counterfeit Godhead. The devil makes him a counterfeit of everything God's got. Everything the Lord's got, the devil's got a counterfeit of it. Look at chapter 16 and verse number 13. And I, thought, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. There's your unholy trinity and the counterfeit Godhead. You see that? Out of the mouth of the dragon, there's the devil. Out of the mouth of the beast, there's the Antichrist. 
and out of the mouth of the false prophet. That's the false spirit. There's the devil, the father, the devil, the son, the devil, the unclean spirit. He counterfeits everything that Jesus Christ has. The devil hates God. He wants to mimic God and mock God. And he, you remember what he said back there before he fell? He said, I will exalt myself. High will be what? Like the Most High. We, don't, we need to get it through our head tonight that the devil wants to be as much like God as he possibly can. By the way, that's why they get down and scream and holler at them rock concerts because they are saying that the rock concerts are the churches of today and what they're actually having is a worship service. Did you know that Black Sabbath had a concert not long ago in Canada and gave an invitation for young people to come down and give their life to the devil? An altar call. It's a counterfeit Godhead. You see those spirits like frogs? I've always believed frogs were like demons. Matter of fact, I believe that all the ugly animals you can think of are pictures of something spiritual that really exists. I can't prove that. You may think I'm crazy for believing it, but I can't help. What if they're bound to represent something? You know flies are a picture of something. You know frogs are a picture of something. And if you could see a demon, he'd look like a big old slimy, green, greasy frog looking at you. He wouldn't be a cute little boy with a little smile on his face and two little ears with a little pitchfork, you know, running around on Halloween going, eh, I got you. And that's the way a demon really looks. Brother, the devil has a counterfeit Godhead. The devil, the father, Satan. The devil, the son, the Antichrist. And the devil, an unclean spirit, the false prophet. Well, let me show you something else. The devil has a counterfeit church. Revelation chapter 2. Turn to Revelation chapter 2 right quick, and we'll see that he has, an, uh, he has a counterfeit church. The Antichrist has a counterfeit church. Every building with a steeple on it is not a church. Brother, don't you ever think that. Don't you ever think that. You say, well, ain't all religions good? No, sir, all religions ain't good. You say, ain't they all going to the same place? All but one of them. You say, uh, ain't all the religions in the world uh, working to get to the same place? All but one. They're all working to go to hell except one. They're saved by grace and going to heaven. I'm going to slow down just a little bit. Revelation chapter 2. I've been in snow and 75 degrees and sweating and out at night and I don't know if it's getting to me or what. Revelation chapter number 2 and look at verse number 9. Revelation 2, 9. I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy which of them would say they're Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Devil's got a church. Let me show you something number three. The devil's got a counterfeit ministry. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, we see that the Antichrist has counterfeit ministers. People said, well, this guy says he's a preacher. Well, so what? Give me up on this one here, brother, or this little, and I'm going to move over here. People say, well, so-and-so, he's a... I, I can't find anything wrong. This woman's not here tonight, so I'm going to say this. I wouldn't embarrass her. It's my mom. <laughs> and you know, a few years ago, well, it's been a long time ago, when I first started preaching, I went in one house one Sunday morning, and mom had Garner Ted Armstrong on. I said, mom, what are you doing? She said, well, what's the matter, Danny? She didn't know who he was. And I said, don't you know who that guy is? He's a false prophet. 
old Herbert W., you know, his old daddy and Garner Ted, I think he finally, he backslid and they kicked him out or something. And then uh, Herbert finally died and somebody else took over. But back then, boy, back about ten years ago, old Garner Ted, he had a following, man. And he had the worldwide church of tomorrow and all this stuff. No hell, nobody saved or they're dead. And all kind. He's a British Israelite. We don't have time to go into that tonight, but that divides the children of Judah from the other and the other Israel, I believe, from the rest of the ten tribes and says they're not Jews and a whole bunch of stuff like that. And did you know, I went in and I said, Mom, that guy's a crook. Don't watch him. She said, well, Danny, you shouldn't criticize him. I ain't heard him say one thing wrong. And I've learned, told her this. I didn't tell her this then, but... I've learned it down through the years. And I heard a preacher say it one time and it stuck in my mind. You know, ever ever heard a preacher say something? And buddy, I mean, it just sticks. It's the Holy Ghost just bangs it right in your soul. It's like a nail and it's there. And I ain't never forgot it. He said this. And y'all get this? If you can learn it like I did, it'll save you a lot of trouble in these days. He said, you don't identify a false prophet by what he preaches. You identify a false prophet by what he don't preach. Anybody can get up there and say, God loves you. That's true, ain't it? We all should love each other and be kind to our neighbor and try to do the Sermon on the Mount. Well, that don't mean you're a preacher, brother. You listen to him and see what he tells you about hell. There's a sure test right there. What does a man believe about hell? You don't find any... I don't know one false prophet that believes in a literal burning hell that lies forever. I don't know one. I don't know one real cop that believes in an eternal hell. I know some Christians are a little messed up that believe in it, but I don't know one false doctrine, prophet, preacher on earth. I mean some way far out nut like uh, Reverend Ike or, or somebody. or Who's that fellow out there in California? Gene Scott. Have you ever seen Gene Scott? Oh, Lord, hey, if you've been inspired, that blessing, ain't you? Well, I first heard about him when my mom went to California and visited my aunt. And she come back telling me about it. She said, Danny, there's a preacher on out in California. He's on 24 hours a day on the satellite and cusses like a sailor and smokes a cigar while he's doing it. I said, I don't believe that. Sure enough, buddy, I was up in Kentucky, and this fellow had one of them things, them big old, big things out in his yard, a uh, satellite dish. And I said, hey. Do you know of a preacher? Is there a preacher that comes on there named Eugene Scott? And he thought for a minute. And I said, he's from California. He said, oh, him? I said, yeah, put him on. Put him on. I want to see him. And he was at the church one night. He dialed that thing around there. I don't know how many channels he He dialed around there and dialed around there. And directly, sure enough, there he was, buddy. And all my, all, everything I'd heard was true. He sits back in a chair like this, and all he talks about is the great pyramids over in Egypt. <laughs> and, you know, the alleged longitude and latitude. And Oh, Lord, he's, he's just a smart nut. He's a quack. And he's got a big old beard and wears an old hat. And he's laid back smoking a cigar saying, You want to learn more about the pyramids? Well, if you do, send some money in here, and we'll be back in a few minutes. <laughs> I thought, Lord, they jump on Jim Baker. They get on Jimmy Swire. Why don't somebody do nothing about that guy? That's what he said. He said, now if you want me to continue this, send in, get on them phones. Now get on them phones and call in here and send some money and we'll be back after this commercial. And he loves horses. And during the commercial, it showed them all riding horses down through there. And it had this wild rock jazz music playing. And then here he come back in again, puffing on that cigar. To me, there ain't but one thing nicer than a cigar, and that's a pipe. That gives me the headache quicker than anything. I cannot stand the smell of pipe. There might be somebody in here who smokes pipe. I don't know, but man, I'll tell you, stand it. So he's puffing away like that, you know. And he rears back there and draws you a little picture of the pyramids of what's going to happen here and there. There ain't a lick of gospel in what he's saying. But about everything he says is right. Let's look at it. Second Corinthians chapter 11. Look and see what it says. 11. Boy, you think there, there it is again. Verse 13. That's what it was on that first one. Second Corinthians 11, 13. Just a minute ago I showed you Revelation, verse 13. 
For such are false apostles. So there is such thing as a fake. Deceitful workers. Transforming themselves into the apostle of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. But he don't ever get it. Don't ever, 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 ever doubt it. The devil is able to appear in a form of an angel, excuse me, an angel of light. And he has a counterfeit ministry. The God of this world. Now let's straighten out something here. There is a great thirst for power in the world today. Many, many, many young people from the interview that got into devil worship and Satanism, they all say the same thing. They said, they said it would give me power. And I thought if I could have it, I could have power. People want power. We're living in a power-hungry generation. But let's see what the devil can do here in these last... You better be careful about this power business in the last days because it ain't all of God. And you've got to be real careful about all these preachers that say, boy, the power of God is going to move greater than it ever had. The power of God, the power of God, when we've done signs, healing, one. You better watch that in this day. Now, God did that, and God can still work miracles, don't you get me wrong. But you better watch that stuff in this generation. It might not always be God. I ain't trying to mess you up or nothing, but... I might as well just go ahead and say it. Can the devil work miracles? The answer, of course, is absolutely. You wouldn't believe the Christians that don't believe that. Y'all, this is a good church. Y'all can take it. You can, you're, you're, you're open to what the Word of God says. You'd be surprised if I said that in a lot of churches, what they'd do. I've heard it said all of my life, well, the devil ain't got power to get life. He does, too. I'll show it to you. You say, I've never heard it before. Just because you've never heard it before, it don't mean it ain't right. Amen? Let's see what the book says. Let's start over there in Revelation, guess what chapter? And guess what verse? <laughs> Two more nights and it's you know what. You know what, I, you know what October 31st is backwards? Amen. Were you going to be that night hiding under the bed? <coughs> Revelation thirteen thirteen. You don't think the devil's got power? Now, he has no power except what God will let him have, but he does have it. Revelation thirteen thirteen. this during the tribulation. And he doeth great wonders... So that he make a fire come down from heaven and the earth uh, upon the earth on the, from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Now listen here, ladies and gentlemen. We'll read another verse there in just a second. If a man come into the average, I'm not trying to be hateful, I'm not trying to be ugly, but if a man came into the average church that emphasizes miracles, I don't, I'm not saying that God don't work miracles. I am not saying God don't heal. I am not saying God can't do anything. God can. But if a man come into the average meeting where emphasis is put on miracles and call fire out of heaven, and he'll, they would say he's the greatest man of God that's ever been there. And he might be a devil. He might be a devil. Brother, you don't judge a man by him being able to heal somebody. You don't judge a man by him calling down fire out of heaven. You don't judge a man by what he, what he uh, jerking rabbits out of hats or, or doing something like that. He said, what are you judging by? You judge him by what he believes about this book and about heaven and hell and Jesus and blood and how he believes a man gets saved. And to look at how, where he puts Jesus Christ. They some of them, brother, they work miracles, but don't even believe Jesus is God in the flesh. They're of the devil. Look at there. Look at verse 14. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those what? Miracles. You say, Brother Danny, I thought if a man did a miracle, that meant God's power was on him. It don't do it. 
which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. That ain't nothing. Look at the rest of this verse. Saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image. See, they made an image to the beast which had the by, womb by sword and did live. Look at verse 15. Don't ever forget this. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause many who was not worse than the image of the beast should be killed. All right. Let's go back to Luke now. I wrote these scriptures down this afternoon as they came to my mind. Luke chapter 9. I'll show you another one. Another one. Luke chapter 9. <coughs> Excuse me. If I don't quit smoking, it won't kill me. Luke chapter 9. I'm sorry, I don't smoke. There might be visitors here. That's how stuff gets started on me. Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. I do not smoke. Quit last week. <coughs> Luke chapter 9. Verse 1. Then he called his twelve disciples together. Now, any Bible scholar in here tell me was Judas in that twelve? Why, absolutely he was. There's no doubt about it. Everybody in here say amen if you believe Judas was in that twelve. Amen. Every, I ain't going to do that to you. I'm, I don't want to trick you, but Judas was not saved. Amen. I've heard people say, boy, oh, Judas, he is a saved man. And then he lost it. No, he didn't do, didn't done it. He was a devil. Amen. You said, no, the devil come in him later. The devil come in him later. Before the devil come in him, Jesus said he was a devil. He was a little devil, and then the big devil got in him when he took the sock. Ain't that right? Ain't that what the book said? My job. You say, well, Baptist, don't. Hey, man, I'm a Baptist second. I'm a Bible preacher first. I'm going to say what the book says first. If the Baptists don't like that, they can jump in Lake James for all I care. This book's what's going to take us through. And Jesus said, Have not I chosen you twelve and one of you? Well, before the devil got in him, is a devil. You say, what was Judas? He was a devil. I've heard people say, well, what does that mean he was? It means he's a devil. You say, does that mean he's a normal man? Didn't say he's a normal man, said he's a devil. You say, what does that mean? I reckon it just means he's a devil. I'm saved because I'm saying what the book says. You ain't going to get me out on a limb. You ain't going to get me out there and say, Brother Daddy, I didn't say it. I said he is a devil. And he was. Because Jesus said he was. And we ain't got time to go in the study of him. Oh, by the way, he's the only man in the Bible that's called son of perdition. And that's what the Antichrist is called. Oh, by the way, it don't say Judas went to hell when he died either. Said he went where? Boy, you are getting it. You're getting it good. He went to his own place. I bet you I could do that in the average church I preach in, and nobody would know it. He went to his own place. You say, where was that? He's an angel over a pit in Revelation chapter 9. You say, what was he? He was a devil. <laughs> All right. Luke 9, 1. Then he called his disciples together, twelve disciples, and gave them. Now, who's the them referred to? That's God referred to the twelve disciples. Did it, does it say he called his twelve disciples together and gave eleven of them power and authority except Judas who was the traitor? Don't say that, does it? Now you are you bound to draw the conclusion that the them refers to the twelve. If I understand anything about Bible interpretation at all, the them refers to the twelve. He called twelve and gave them power. You say, well, I don't mean all of them. Well, you're making it say something it don't say. He said them. If them didn't get it, then all of them didn't. You got that, didn't you? That was deep. I know one thing. He gave them power. Verse 2. And he sent them to preach. You mean God sent a devil to preach? That's what it says. To preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. You mean to tell me that the Lord sent a devil to heal the sick? That's what it says. I ain't arguing with a book. You say, well, I'll straighten you out at the church. You don't straighten me out. That's what the book said. Straighten it out. All right, let's go to another one. 
way back in the Old Testament, the book of Exodus. In Exodus chapter 8. Now, I'll have one more after this and we'll be through. Exodus chapter number 8. I'm just showing you how the devil has a counterfeit power. You say, well, Brother Danny, I've always believed the devil didn't have power to work miracles. You have always believed wrong. You say, well, where does he get it? God allows him to have it. All power is originally from God. But God allowed the devil to have a certain amount of power. That's all the way through the Bible. In the book of Job, God allowed the devil to do certain things to Job. He couldn't do it until God allowed him. Plain as day. All right? Exodus chapter 8. Now, you'll notice that the story in the book of Exodus... Now, so let me clear up something here. The story in the book of Exodus, there's counterfeit miracles right and left. And a good example, I wouldn't even plan on telling you this, but I just thought of it. When Moses threw his rod down, what them other two fellas do? They throw their rod down, and they turn into snakes just like... Do you think God did that? The devil did that. They had power to turn their rods into serpent. I don't have power to do that. I don't know a preacher no work turned that microphone stick into a snake. But they did it, and it was a power of the devil. In Exodus 4, 3 and 4, 4 5 words that along in there somewhere. And every time Moses would make a miracle, they would counterfeit the miracle. You say, well, Brother Danny, from what you're sounding like, the devil's as powerful as God. Uh-uh. No, there's a line. There's a line. You say, where's God draw the line? In Exodus chapter 8, I'll show you the line. Look at Exodus chapter 8 and verse 16. We can shout on this. Exodus 8 and verse 16. And the Lord said unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Stretch out thy rod, and smite the dust of the land, that it may become lice throughout all the land of Egypt. And they did so. For Aaron stretched out his hand with a rod and smote the dust of the earth, and it became lice. He turned the dust into lice, and man and in beast, and all the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. Verse 18. Watch this. And the magicians did so with their enchantments to bring forth lice, but they could not. So there were lice upon man upon beast. Then the magician said unto Pharaoh, we can't do this in Pharaoh. This is the finger of God. That stumped them right there. That stumped them. Hold your Bible open there now. I'll show you why that is. You say, preacher, why did, why did he let them? They could throw a, throw a rod into a snake. They could turn water to blood. They could do this. They could do all them other things. But when it come to making the dust lice, they couldn't do it. They went to Pharaoh and said, Pharaoh, we can't do this. And he said, what's the matter, you guys? They said, man, this is the finger of God. And what you know what they're saying? Nobody can do this but God. You say, why? What's the big deal about turning? The key word is dust. Dust. You know how God started, made me and you out to start with? Out of the what? Dust. The devil can work miracles, but thank God He can never counterfeit the original creation of God. He can't do it. God draws a line right there and says, No, Father, Son, you can have that much power, you can turn a little uh, rod into a snake, but when it comes to creating something out of the dust of earth, no, I'm the one to do that. Thank God there's a limit. Hallelujah! There's only so far the devil can go. But he does go pretty far. He does go pretty far. The last thing I'll say this evening is the Antichrist will have a counterfeit salvation. Let's turn and look at it. One more scripture, and this will be the last one. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And I've probably done and said some things that got you to thinking here tonight, and I'm going to say a couple more. The reason I say stuff like this a lot of times is because you need a little meat from the Word once in a while, and also... It gets you interest up in the Bible to make you want to study. If I can get you to disagree with me on something or something, it'll make you dig or provoke you or something. Second Corinthians chapter 11. Second Corinthians chapter 11. All right. <coughs> Look at verse 3. Look at verse 3. But I fear... 
lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. So your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Verse 4. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus. Now y'all tell me, is there another Jesus? No. But he said there's going to be some fellas preaching another Jesus. From the way they preach, it's a completely different Jesus from the way we preach. Another Jesus. That has always scared me. That scripture has always bothered me. You know, you hear a lot of these guys and they sound like they're kind of off the wall a little bit. You don't want to condemn them. You don't want to say, well, they're the devil. You know, I, ain't, I don't want to do that. But sometimes you just think it's almost like they're preaching another Jesus. You ever heard that kind? It's not the Jesus we know. I mean, you know, after we've been in church so long and studied the Bible and prayed and sang and felt the Spirit of God, you just feel like you know Jesus, don't you? You know Jesus. Then you hear an, some character coming out, this lowly meek Nazarene that done this, and the way they present it, it's almost like another person you ain't never met before. It's another Jesus. That scares me. That's scary. That's what, that's what boggles my mind is when they come off with that other Jesus. That, that ain't the worst part. Or if you receive another spirit, which you have not received, or another gospel, which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. According to that, everything that's gospel ain't gospel, and everything that's Jesus ain't Jesus, and everything that's spirit ain't spirit. Now, I'll just give you this to think about, and I don't claim to be an expert on spiritual things, but I do know this, like begats like. An apple tree makes seeds fall on the ground, another apple tree comes up. Two polar bears going to have a baby polar bear. Uh, an orange tree, when orange seeds are planted, they're going to have oranges on them. Like begets like. And I'm not saying, I better be careful how I say this, but I will say this. Some people go where there's a counterfeit spirit. And get a counterfeit spirit and never do get the real thing. They never do. I'm not a judge. I'm not saying everybody has to act like I act. I'm not saying everything. But brother, there is a common bond among God's people. You can go, you say, well, it's a culture and we're raised here. Uh uh-uh. uh. You can go anywhere in the world and if a person's really saved and loves that book, there'll be a common bond between you and them. I'll guarantee you. In Germany, it was like that. In Haiti, where we found those that were really saved, there was like a kindred spirit. Oh, let me say this one time. The Bible don't say none of this stuff about my spirit bearing witness with your spirit. I've heard people say, well, I just don't believe he's saved because my spirit didn't bear witness with him. Well, who in the world are you, man? Maybe you're not tuned in right today. I, well, some people sure do have a high opinion of their spiritual discernment. You can't say who's saved and who ain't. I've heard people say, well, the Bible said my spirit bear witness with your spirit. No, it don't either. It says his spirit bears witness with our spirit that we're the children of God. Get it right. Get it right. You say, well, why are you so technical about little words? There's a lot of difference between saying his spirit bears witness with ours and mine bears witness with yours. A lot of difference. There's a lot of difference in that. If you say mine bears witness with yours, I can go around and say who's saved or not. If you say his bears witness with mine, only he knows who's saved, and he tells me that I am saved because his spirit bears witness with my spirit that I'm a child of God. And I've seen people just looking at people's eyes. You know, see how red they got when they shook their hands and how, I don't know, I discerned a bad spirit from me. You better watch that stuff. You ain't that spiritual. You ain't that spiritual. Somebody's got a weird spirit. You won't have to look in their eyes, do you? You'll know it after you've been around them a little bit. All right, I'm going to say this. I was born in the fire at Nebo Baptist Church under an old preacher named Joe Parson. And where he come from, they got the same thing. And where he come from, they got the same thing. And you can trace that stuff all the way back to the days of the apostles. I got saved because of that bunch. That's the right bunch. You say, how do you know it's the right bunch? I just know it is. Their spirit bears witness with my spirit. (laughs) I tell you, brother, I know it's the right bunch. You say, how do you know? His Spirit 
chose me. His bus. You just know, man. You just know when you're hooked up with the right bus. You just know when you get in the old time way and you start reading that book. I'll tell you one good way. What you feel in here and what you read in here just clicks. It all goes together. The same spirit comes off these pages that's inside of you. And when the choir starts singing, that same spirit bears witness with your spirit. You just know, man, you're in the family. You've got the right one. We ought to shout till doomsday because God showed enough mercy on us that we got the right spirit. But I tell you what, buddy, there's some weird spirits out in the world. All right, I'm going to make a statement now. now this is not, I'm not saying this is a doctrine. And where I go nowadays, I get jumped on for preaching about striper and Christian rock. And the first thing a young per boy got me, uh, where was I? Down in Atlanta the other night. When me and him, man, he got me down there after I got through preaching. He said, I can't believe that you said what you did. I said, what? He said, about striper. He said, I agreed with all the rest of it. But he said, I can't believe you said that. They're Christians. I said, I didn't say they wasn't Christians. Maybe they are. I don't know. He said, there's a lot of people get saved at them concerts. And brother, that's just like the Lord hit me. And I looked at him and I said, you don't know if they're getting saved or not. Maybe they are. Maybe they ain't. With the spirits in that atmosphere, I'd be afraid to trust it. Amen, brother. Amen. You say, now, brother Danny, you can get saved. I know you can get saved anywhere. I believe a man can get saved in a bar. I believe a man can get saved in, in, in a strip joint or in the middle of a poker game in, in the bottom of New York City. In a bar. I believe a man can get saved anywhere, but it won't be because of that place. It'll be in spite of it. It'll be because he made his prayer to God and went through that jump and touched the real God. But brother, if all you walk down front and say, well, wow, man, I want to see this Jesus man. He's cool, man. I've heard you saying about this Jesus man and he's cool. Well, do you believe that Jesus died and rose again? Yes, man, I believe that. Like, wow, man, like I'm saved. I don't know if I'd trust dying on that. I honestly don't, buddy. I wouldn't want to die. And then you go back and you keep your high along and you keep your party and you keep your old friend and you keep your old music. I don't know if I'd trust that. Honestly. You say you're just one of them old narrow-minded hillbilly preachers. Well, maybe I am, brother. But I'll tell you one thing. The book said, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Not creation, like the new version say. Creature. So maybe you're getting the right spirit there, and then again, maybe you ain't. I'm so fanatical on that. Sometimes if I don't really feel with it, and somebody comes down and gets saved, I doubt it. I say, I don't know if I got the real thing or not, because I don't think I had the real thing. <laughs> and I know it don't depend on what I'm doing. But a lot of times I feel like it does. I feel like anybody that gets saved, here's one of my spiritual youngins. And the Spirit on me rubs off on them. And I know it don't always do that. You better hope it don't. But I'll tell you one thing, brother. Like the guts like. People get saved in this church, turn out just crazy as all the rest of us. <laughs> Amen? There's a counterfeit salvation. You say, well, Brother Danny, you've got me so scared now. How do I even know why? I don't know. Check it out by the book, buddy. Check it out by the book. Is what you've got to teach you to go by the book? If you do, you got the real thing. If you don't, junk it. Get you something that'll go with the book. That's the religion of the Antichrist. I'm glad I got born in the fire. Being saved is more than just a mental ascent to truth. There's a lot of denominations, Church of Christ, stuff like that. They'll come down front and say, Do you believe that Christ died for your sins? Yes. Do you believe He was baptized and rose again for your justification? Yes. Are you willing to repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins? Yes. I baptize this my brother in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Put him down. And he's just as lost as a goose. Amen. You say, how do you know? Because salvation comes from the heart. Amen. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth and believe in thine what? Heart, brother. Heart. Not in your head. In your heart. There's got to be a heart salvation for a man to have the real thing. All right. Let's bow our heads. Amen. Amen. Thank God.
Thank God for the real thing. Thank God for Holy Ghost salvation. You say, well, Brother Daniel, we're living in a confusing day. Son, that is an understatement. We are living in a crazy day. You say, well, how can we stay on track? Stick with the book. Stick with the book. That's our compass. That's our guide. That's our flashlight. That's our headlight. Stick with the book. You'll never go wrong. Dear God in heaven, as we come to the close of this service, we know that out there in the world tonight, Lord, it, it just, it's absolutely gone crazy. And God, here we stand tonight. And Lord, help us to want to do something about to shape this world in. Thank you, Lord, that you let us get the things straight. We didn't deserve it, Lord. We could have been out there deceived like millions. But oh, glory to God, hallelujah. We're so thankful and glad that you let us have the truth. Lord, we know if what we got ain't truth, there ain't none. We know it is because you said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father except by me. And we thank you for that this evening. Thank you for our church. Thank you for everybody that's here. I pray for that one that's struggling right now that you'd help them. I pray for that one that may be doubting their salvation that you'd just help them to settle it tonight and base it on the Word of God, not their feelings, but on faith in your Word. Do what needs to be done in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bless you.